All right, we're live. 86th installment of the Unplugged Alpha podcast series. How you guys doing tonight? We're going to be moving on to some tools for entrepreneurship. Uh, last few weeks, I've covered uh, the origin of money, credit, investing, the kinds of jobs you can do, which will net a very strong income. Uh, I've also just opened the School of Entrepreneurship for enrollment. It closes later on this week. So it's tied into today's topic. Um, let's see here now. So let's start with something fun. Let's have a little bit of a laugh here before we get into the content with these tools of titans of entrepreneurship and some of the stuff that's in the course, some of the positive stuff, some of the not so positive stuff. It's interesting because I do um, I do a lot of my own writing. Um, for the most part, like 95% of the stuff you see out there is, is written by me. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of copywriting that I hire people to do now, but for the most part, it's all me still. Um, I'll talk about that in a second because I did a post on um, the community tab. So let's do this let's start with some memes because memes are fun i like them anyway i said uh earlier this year that i've turned into a little, little bit of a meme lord <laughs> i try not to, i try not to use them too often but they do prove a valuable point all right let's see if we can get this thing up on the screen here let's do all right well this this one's not a meme per se this one's from my buddy noah kagan um He's doing really well on YouTube now, so shout out to Noah. Um, when I was talking to him, it was a year, year and a half, maybe two years ago, he, he was just talking about blowing up his channel. He's really done a good job. Anyway, I saved this from Twitter the other day. He said, entrepreneurship is not risky. Risky is spending your life at a job you hate with people you don't like, working on problems that you don't care about. This is the unfortunate reality of most people's lives. It's just true. Um, you end up surrounding yourself in a, like, I can't, I, I've just lost count of the posts that I see now, whether it's in my community or other discussion boards, or if it's on Facebook or something like that. Becky in such and such department is such a giant B and I don't know what to do. And any win I have in life, it's like a big battle and everybody wants to fight me on it. And I can't stand the woke agenda and blah, blah, blah. And this is the grim reality of a lot of workplaces today. You know, this is this is this is where we're at. Um, people get called in to HR for not using the correct pronouns in their email signature. Um, there's there's all kinds of nonsense that goes on. You know, whatever the woke agenda happens to be, one week it's masculinity is toxic. Next week, we're going to celebrate some dude uh, named Dylan that dresses like a gal and wants to sell like beer. Um, the truth of the matter is is there's a lot of productivity that still happens in corporate gigs, lots of gigs out there. I'm not even just talking corporate, There's lots of gigs out there that have a lot of value that contribute to um, all the services that we enjoy. Fire, water, electricity, toilets wouldn't flush if people didn't do their jobs, right? But the truth of the matter is there is a certain amount of comfort that comes from that. Kevin O'Leary said that a salary is a drug they give you to forget about your dreams. Like Noah said over here, risky is spending your life at a job you hate with people you don't like, working on problems you don't care about. These are called uh, BJs, bullshit jobs, basically. Um, and everybody's worked one at some point. I have too. Uh, but it's worth revisiting and mentioning that. Let me grab one of these other ones here. Why did this one open three times? Okay, cooperate with me. Ah. I like this one too. I've only got three or four of these, but I try to save these whenever I come across them on the interwebs. If anyone ever tells you your dreams are silly, remember there's a millionaire walking around out there who invented these stupid things. How many summers have you spent floating in a pool with these noodles, whatever they call them now, right? Just, you know, keeping you buoyant. And they're not expensive to make, what are they colored foam that's it <laughs> some guy is sitting around right now probably in his pool laughing his ass off thinking i did it pulled it off maybe his kids are enjoying you know the fruits of his labor i don't know but 
Um, there are lots of opportunities out there that, that can be capitalized on. This is a funny one too. Um, window, boom, and share. Entrepreneur. A, a entrepreneur is somebody that wants to become a business owner. In quotations, it says, I'm an idea guy. Big things are coming. I got all these ideas in my head. These are the ideas in their head. So, and I'm not even kidding. I've, I've heard pitches that look something like this. Um, let me tell you something about ideas. There's, there's lots of dudes out there that will come at you. Oh, uh, you know, I got an idea. Or I want you to invest in my idea. Or I got this business thing and here's my NDA sort of thing. And it's like, ideas don't mean anything. Unless you can execute on them, unless you can act on them, unless you can turn them into something, somebody else probably thought of it before you, if we're being honest, okay? Like there's nothing innovative or really that new today. 99.99% of everything that you see is something that has been conventionally thought about before, slightly reinvented differently, a little dab of something, you know, on top of it to change its its profile or whatever, but it's nearly the same thing. There's not a lot of new ideas. Like I am, I am not even a creator myself that say, oh, well, you're a creator. If you're on your, I'm not even a creator myself. I just come across interesting concepts and ideas that I just talk to you guys about. That's really all that I end up doing, right? But ideas, the idea guy, I got a big idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a multimillionaire. Ideas mean nothing unless you can act on them. I got another one here with the Bezos one. Let me see if I can find it. Won't open that one open. What about this one? Come on, cooperate. There we go. All right, I'm going to have to download it again from my email because you have to see this one. This is the OG. Um, where's my email? There it is. Do, 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 do. This one. Okay. So if you've heard of a fellow by the name of Jeff Bezos, then I think this will recognize and resonate. There's a really good book called The Everything Store. Um, can't remember the name of the author, but it's essentially the story of Amazon and Jeff Bezos. It's long. It's like 12 hours long plus um, on the audiobook, but it's definitely worth a checkout. Let me see if I can zoom this in a little bit more so you can see our friend. Now, this is Bezos working away on his computer. I don't know if he's coding or what he's up to. This is an old, this, this desk that he's working on, you can see these triangle uh, supports on each corner. This is just a door, is what I was told. I don't know if they shaved off the handle or what it was, but it's just a door and they put some two by fours on it or some four by fours. And they mounted these triangular supports on the edge. This is how Amazon started. A little spray, can of spray paint on a big piece of paper. Pin that on the wall. Don't even level it. That's how it starts. That's how, that's how every successful business starts. It's just get on with it. You just start it, right? One of the simplest, most fundamental concepts, the mind shift that you have to take to get a business off the ground is to start it. Get the idea out of your head and start, begin, right? It is, It is. look, I hate to spend this much time emphasizing it, but it is an incredibly important component of entrepreneurship. And it is a tool that Titans use, is begin. Because the vast majority of people, they don't do anything with ideas. They don't do any, it's like, I got this great idea and I'm going to be a multimillionaire, da, 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 and they'll talk, they'll talk, they'll talk. And then a year or two years later, they'll see, um, that was my idea. He stole it. Or that was my idea. I, I should have launched it. And he did it before I did. It's like, what do you want to tell you? I used to be in this um, entrepreneur's forum. Good, good friend of mine, Thomas. Shout out to him. Um, had a very successful exit. And he spent way too much time. Did update after update, month after month. Got to get this off the ground. Oh, I don't like this, this web domain because it's got dot info at the end and I got to buy the dot com and they fought to buy that for a few hundred thousand dollars. It's like, you know, he went back and forth. It's like, you know, one day I just, I just smashed the table and said, look, man, I love you like a brother. This thing has legs. You know, it has legs. You already have an exit. Stop hesitating. Stop burning through cash. This is something, a group of three or four 20 year olds straight out of Stanford or some like 
high tech university somewhere are going to come running at with a case of Red Bull and raging boners and just take you guys out because they're so fast to market. You need to get stuff to market. Tools of Titans. One of the one of the most critical ones. One of the one of the most fundamental starting points is just getting at it, man. Just getting at it, getting it off the ground, and starting. Let's remove that. Um, oh, and my favorite. Actually, let's talk about this one too because I just posted this on the community tab of um, my Entrepreneurs in Cars YouTube channel. Um, oh, let me actually do this before we continue. So YouTube, here we go. Uh, so the link for the School of Entrepreneurship, I'll get in details on that later on, is uh, it's in the chat. I'm just going to pin it to the top and leave it there for the duration of the show because it's an important reminder of what I'm leaning into here. Um, Put this up on the screen. This one. This is the one. Present, share, and boom. That's it right there. You guys ever see this one? Let me go larger screen for you. Must be willing to work in fast paced and exciting environment. <clears throat> Sounds like the job for me. I used to run ads like that all the time. Must be willing to work in a fast-paced and exciting environment. And this was literally the environment. Cubicle. Now, you sat Becky down to that cubicle. She's going to have a little picture in the corner of her and her fur baby on Santa's lap saying Merry Christmas. And a bunch of other random, you know, trinkets and, you know, poppers and spinners and all sorts of stuff on the table. It was never that clean. I, I, can't, I can't remember anybody in the office that had it. A desk that clean. There was that one like OCD type type dude. So they didn't normally exist. But this is another one of my favorites, right? Like this is the literal environment for most of these spaces, right? Anyway, so I posted this here earlier today. It looks like about an hour ago. I'm just going to read it to you um, because it'll take um, a bit to shift it over to you guys go see it. So I'll just read it to you. It's not it's not super long. They lied to you. Here's the truth about jobs and why entrepreneurship is the way forward. Job, J O B. It's an acronym. It stands for just over broke. You never create wealth for yourself or anti fragility for that matter. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the concept of anti fragility, I'm going to grab my drink here because it's going to take some air out of my lungs. I just, by the way, I just had my first fight this weekend in a boxing type of environment, boxing ring, and I won by a narrow margin. My opponent was 20 years younger heavier, taller, and had a better reach than me. And my neck is still sore today from the couple of shots that I took. Even though I edged out, I'm going to tell you, at my age, I don't know if I'll be doing a lot more of these, but I, but I needed to do it. I needed to get it out of my system, right? Like many things in life, you have to get them out of your system. Anyway, um, I posted about it on Instagram. You guys can go check it out over there. Back to the post here. Uh, J-O-B, just over broke. You never create wealth for yourself or anti-fragility for that matter. You're a cog in a wheel of conformity. Back to anti-fragility. If you're not familiar with the concept, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, I can't remember the sequence of his name. He wrote a book called Anti-Fragility. I'm not on board with his takes on, you know, uh, the scamdemic and the, and, the and the necessity for jabbing and all that sort of stuff. He's out in left field on that. But I think his notion of anti-fragility is an important one that you have to understand as a guy, if you're doing something of significance in your life, because it because it's protective and it improves your life. And what I mean by that is there's three basic states. There's fragile, uh, there's robust, and there's anti-fragile. So fragile, I can use this as a good example. I have these double-walled mugs, okay? They're good for not burning your hands on the outside and to keep your tea warm, but they do break from time to time, even just in the dishwasher, just because of the design of them. So they're fragile, right? You know, if I want to ship one of these to you, I'd have to bubble wrap it, popcorn wrap it, triple wrap it, and put it in the bag and write fragile all over it. You apply stress to something that's fragile, it breaks. The next area is robustness. Um, what do I have here that's robust? Not much. Use my wallet. So 
one of these sacred wallets, wallets, you know, they're, they're pretty cool. They're compact. Um, you can drop it. You can throw it against something. They're pretty durable. Um, it's a, it's a quality product. It's probably not going to break. I could probably drop this off a 20 story building and I'm sure it would be pretty much just fine if it landed, you know, not too badly, but that's, you know, that's an example of something robust, uh, lens cap here, something that's robust. It, 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 it just won't get damaged if you throw it against a wall, basically speaking. Then there's a the concept of anti-fragility. Anti-fragility is important to understand because when you apply stress, when you apply chaos to it, it improves. There's not many things in the world that improve when you apply stress or chaos to it. Uh, you take the business world out there and the last scamdemic, and I have friends that own, like one of my best friends owns a gym and he was barely surviving before the scamdemic during when they locked him down and they didn't give sufficient funds to keep him going to cover any of the expenses any of those things wiped like a lot of people got wiped clean during the scandemic but that that was an a, event of chaos that was an event of uh difficulty and there were certain businesses that thrived in that environment one of them was amazon we talked about jeff bezos before didn't we right so in a scenario like that storefronts close can't sit down in restaurants anymore. It's pickup only, stand on dots, social, whatever the hell you know they were doing and bullshit like that. But Amazon did very, very well during that time. If you take a look at their stock during that period of time, it took off because people were ordering shit like crazy online. That's an example of a business that becomes anti-fragile and they just improve with chaos. Anyway, back to this post over here. And it, you guys can go read it. It's on the Entrepreneurs of Cars YouTube channel on the community tab. You never create true wealth for yourself or anti-fragility for that matter. You're a cog in a wheel of conformity. Trust me, I know this from my 20s because I was a wage, wage slave in an office environment. And I also worked loads and loads of labor-intensive jobs in my teens. A lot of people go, well, why did, you never worked a job. You never did any labor. Dude, I planted uh, forests for the Ministry of Natural Resources in my teen years uh, for three months in the summer. I cleared out portage trails. I worked as an apprentice mechanic doing brake jobs, tune-ups, uh, alignments, all kinds of shit like that. Uh, I've done a lot. I've, I've, I've done uh, roofing work. I've done a lot of shit that requires your hands and back-breaking labor, which is why I respect people that do that. Although it is needed and is required, and I think there's going to be a strong demand for it, I, I still don't think that it's the best way for you guys to live long-term as far as you know, optimizing and getting the best results out of your life. Um, office job, it's, it's always the same shit. I wrote it here. Get up, commute, work, take short breaks, work, commute home, pay tax, sleep, repeat. You're a tool, right? And I was that guy too. That's, how I, that's why I understand this concept. You trade an hour of your time for an hour of comp compensation. And that hour of time could be minimum wage, right? Like when I started working, minimum wage was, I don't know, 275, 285 an hour. It wasn't a lot. It seemed like a lot at the time. <laughs> I remember doing the math, busting out the solar powered calculator and be like, well, if I work this long, uh, then I'll be able to buy, you know, my favorite car sort of thing. But, um, you know, you can exchange a block of time for a block of payment. And that's just how things work out. It can be 285 an hour, 15 bucks, whatever minimum wage is now. I think it's 14, 15 bucks an hour here. $250 an hour, you know, $800 an hour. I had some guy in the comments like, well, I'm a surgeon or I'm a doctor. Or no, he said, I'm a physician and I can make $250 an hour. Okay, good. So you make more per block of hour. There's only 24 hours in a day. If you're going to be exchanging time for money, which is what you're doing when you're taking salary or if you're taking an hourly rate or something like that, you should maximize what it should be, right? Thousand bucks, two thousand, five thousand dollars an hour, whatever you can push it up to, whatever your hourly rate should look like. Anyway, so you're still a tool, you know, because you're still exchanging time for money. Kevin O'Leary said it best: salary is a drug that you that you get to forget about your dreams. I talked about that earlier. Also, if you live in the West in a large urban city, being a millionaire is almost meaningless today. When I was a kid, the notion of being a millionaire was almost unreachable. It was, it was like, oh, only, only a, a certain type of person can reach that. And that's a limiting belief that I created for myself. And it took me decades longer to reach that achievement because I had that limiting belief. And I've talked about this before. How do you change that? You raise your standards. If you increase your standards, then you have new beliefs that fill that gap, right? You know, as you raise your standards sort of thing. Um, 
back to this point over here. Financial freedom. Um, a million dollars doesn't get you where it once did, especially in a large urban city. You're talking Toronto, Vancouver, Miami, LA, New York, Chicago, any big, large urban center. Being worth a million dollars isn't that much. You, like 10 million is probably going to give you FU money is basically what I'm saying at this point. Um, there's essentially six sources of income, which I've covered in a prior uh, cast, which I'll recap very quickly. One, C-suite job, CEO, CFO. Two, licensed professionals, so doctors, lawyers, accountants, stuff like that. Three, high ticket sales. You're selling yachts, jets, mansions, that sort of stuff. Four, fame. Uh, fa sorry, fame with an audience. So that would include actors, musicians, influencers, even these TikTok weirdos that dance around like monkeys. If they have a large enough audience, they're going to make a lot of money. Only fans, <laughs> believe it or not, you know, these, some of these gals are, are getting paid 50, 60, hundred thousand dollars a month showing pictures of stuff that you can just Google, you know, if you really want, but that's, that's the simp economy. That's what simps do to the economy. Uh, five STEM software engineers, tech leads. I've talked to people that work for the fan companies, you know, the Facebooks, the Amazons of the world. Um, you're doing well. You can make seven, $800,000 a year. Uh, and number six, entrepreneurship, which is basically what I'm leading into this cast and what I'm going to talk about. Some will argue, oh, but rich, I have X number of doors and people pay me rent and they make me rich, blah, blah, blah. Look, real estate's an investment like anything else. So you can invest money, which will pay dividends. But even if you work one through five on my prior list over there and you still acquire uh, wealth, you're still plugged into, you know, the matrix, so to speak. Like you're still one of the tools sort of thing. You, you still need to comply. If you're a licensed uh, doctor, for example, or a lawyer, for example, and you've got all the doors, blah, 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 I've got this rental income coming in sort of thing, you're still exposed to some risk, you know? Oh, the next pandemic comes along. Sorry, sir, you're going to take these jobs. Otherwise, we're going to fire you. Fuck me, right? Oh, sorry, sir. Uh, are, are, you know, your tenants won't be able to pay your rent anymore. Do you know how many guys I know that almost got cleaned out because they were landlords and people just stopped paying rent because they lost their jobs and you can't throw them out, especially in the wintertime here in Canada. Anyway, you can't throw somebody out, right? So you got squatters living, living in your property and you're covering the mortgage and they're not covering the rent anymore. So it's coming out of your pocket. Now you're very strongly cash flow negative, right? These are the sorts of things that I look at and some people will be like, oh, well, you're looking too far into it. No. This is why I did fine during the scamdemic and I had my inbox and my DMs and everybody calling in going, they're threatening to do this to me if I don't do that. And if I don't do this and I got a roof, you know, to keep over the family's head, my wife will leave me. And this, it's like, look, this is why I procure and I think through these things. So the strategies are available. Anyway, let's keep going. And why I'm talking about entrepreneurship and what these tools are. Uh, almost every actor, doctor, lawyer, CEO that wore their face diapers, took the jabs, bent the knees, used pronouns in their email bio when corporate calls for it. I never had to deal with that when I was in corporate, but it's a reality of today. They got to eat their woke rainbows and bend the knee to whatever is trending that month. They have a new month for everything now. They got months for this part of the alphabet, that part of the alphabet, the plus part of the alphabet, they're, they're celebrating it continuously. I don't see that on the day-to-day -day basis, but I've still, but I still have friends that work in corporate gigs and it's reality of their life. Sometimes I see it in the email signatures. People message me and they'll be like, I'm part of the marketing team or something to do with this. And I'll look at their email signature and it's got like pronouns in there. I'm just like, <laughs> no. Anyway. So it's a monkey see, monkey do sort of environment. Most societies don't want freedom anymore. They want free stuff. That applies to the government specifically, right? People, people vote for big governments, big incompetent governments, by the way, because the governments say, oh, well we'll, well, we'll create more jobs or we'll give you tax credits or we'll lift the burden of the amount of taxes you have to pay on your fuel or something like that. People are like, yes, give me that. I want to vote for more of that crazy shit. But they don't realize there's a consequence to that, which includes more control and more involvement in their life. They, the state comes into your house and into your pocketbook and into your life. We already know that they're already into family law. You know, you can't, you can't even live with a woman now in a way that looks like marriage without the state saying, okay, now you're married, even though you didn't take any vows. And because you're parting ways, we need to uh, slice and dice, you know, all the assets. And it's just the way things are, right? 
So anyway, um, most society doesn't want freedom. We talked about that. They have their agenda. It's got to be yielded to. Monkey see, monkey do. Don't ask questions. Do as you're told. The question that I always ask when somebody starts complaining to me about these things, which I hear often, is, well, how is that working out for you, and what are you doing differently about it? I did a survey on the community tab of the Entrepreneurs of Cars channel about three or four weeks ago because people asked me about different things, and I said, in the survey, what would you like to see more content on? Um, improving relationships, improving uh, long-term relationships, how to make more money, self-care. I don't know, I put four or five up. You know what came in at 60%? How to make more money. And I find it very interesting that people are asking about how to make more money, but they don't necessarily do things to make life-changing more money. Let's keep going anyway. Most people just keep going into the into that specific direction. They see the code in the matrix. They see what's going on. They want to fully unplug, but they haven't done anything about it. Your government, your boss, society, women, they don't give a shit about your struggles, thoughts, opinions, freedom, or sovereignty. They want you on their plan, plugging the lies, paying the taxes, in debt. Debt is a slavery mechanism. I've I've talked about this extensively on my Total Debt Freedom channel. Yes, I have a lot of YouTube channels. The one I set up in 2009 when I was running my debt business, I've talked extensively how they enslave people with credit card debt. It's not designed to be indulged in and then escape from very quickly. There are mechanisms engineered into debt to enslave you, to keep you in that vicious cycle so that you're always paying interest and you're always under their thumb. Very few people understand this concept. Even when I speak about it, they'll read it, they'll nod their head, and then they just go on with their lives. They don't do anything differently. Follow rules, bending the knee to whatever's trending to control the masses. One week, it's all, well, I already talked about that part. So let's talk about entrepreneurs and how they generally play. Most play not to lose. So I have a, a playlist, a podcast playlist, on the Entrepreneurs and Cars channel, it's called Playing to Win. And they're really just conversations about chasing excellence, some very interesting guests. If you haven't seen it yet, go check it out. But there's a, there's a, there's a corollary to that, you know, if you will. And it's called Playing Not to Lose. And I've said this before, you know, in life, most of the time, very successful men that get things done play to win. A lot of the people that just sort of get through life okay play not to lose and while playing to win and playing not to lose sound like very very similar things they're very different when you play to win you know you basically put your cards down and you bet on that win when you play not to lose you're preserving and make no mistake there's there's times in life where you should play to win more and there's times in life where you should play not to lose if you're in the autumn years of your life and you've only got a few decades left I wouldn't say go out there and play to win. I'd say, you know, preserve your capital, make sure, you know, you're you're very conservative, strategic about how you deploy money, what you invest in, stuff like that. That's more of a play not to lose strategy, and that's totally fine. But but if you're young, if you're in your 20s or your 30s, you got a lot of runway ahead of you, you got to play harder. You got to play to win, right? And this is what entrepreneurs do. This is one of the tools that they understand is when they're going to get into a business, they, they just play to win with it, man. There's, there's no effing around, right? Anyway, uh, nine out of 10 businesses fail. So I came across this stat well over a decade ago. The vast majority, 90% of businesses will fail within three years, okay? And then of the ones that survive, so let's say 10% after three years survive, 98% of the ones that survive never crack a million dollars in annual sales. I want you to think about that for a sec because that's a fucking big number, okay? The vast majority, 90% of businesses will never go anywhere. And then you've got only about one-tenth, 10% that continue to operate. And of the ones that continue to operate, 98% of them aren't even doing more than a million dollars a year in sales. So things like Facebook, Twitter, SpaceX, Tesla, Amazon, all of these big brand names you hear, Apple, GM, Toyota, all, all of these big names out there, all of them. Some of them have some cool stories. I watched a movie the other night on Lamborghini. Um, and you want to talk about a plane to win story? Go watch the video that just came out on Lamborghini. I can't remember the platform it's on. You have to opt into the 
fucking promo, whatever it is on, on Amazon. But if you go to Amazon prime and search for it, you'll find there, you get a free trial or whatever, but it's like a 90 minute video movie. And I mean, I knew this story from before, but Ferruccio Lamborghini basically grew his business out of spite, partially for his father saying that he wouldn't be able to do it. And partially because Enzo Ferrari brushed him off when he made a recommendation to improve the clutches on his car. They didn't talk about stuff in the movie, like um, a lot of the inventory that he used for his farm tractors came from leftover World War II trucks. But that that is a plain to win story, right? And that company still exists today. It's been acquired by uh, Volkswagen AG, which is part of Porsche, Audi, Lamborghini, Ducati, all, all that stuff. Most businesses never get to that level of recognition. They just sort of sputter along, right? So this is, so this is a big difference. Like I said, when you're playing to win, then you're leaning into an area, you're leaning into a territory that offers viability um, and well past a million dollars in annual sales. I said after that, it's a noble effort, but they basically created a company that employs them. They pay high taxes. They're locked into the local economy, often with a storefront. You have to lock the front door, unlock the front door in the morning. Running a business with low profits, high stress, and they're still a tool. When the state says lockdown for the next scandemic, they got to comply, right? Paying for a college education today in business at best will cost tens of thousands a year and books, tuition take years and you'll be taught by another tool of the matrix that never ran their own business on principles and only show you how to play not to lose. I did this college uh, course on business when I left high school. I never finished it, by the way. My dad um, wanted to start up a business with fans and switches. I think I've told the story before, but it's worth mentioning again because most of you guys come in here new. And um, I wasn't learning anything in the course. Honestly, like I remember sitting, the only course that offered any, much of any interest was a marketing sales course, which was run by a guy that used to run a business like 20 years prior. And, and he had some interesting ideas, but everybody else that taught shit there. I was basically sitting there going like, I could teach this. Like I know more than this dude over here. Anyway, my dad said, I'm gonna go down to the States. We're gonna drive down. I'm gonna do some sales calls on these fans and switches. I'm like 21 years old, okay? I don't even have a suit that fits me properly. It's all baggy and shit. This is a tailored shirt. It's all baggy and shit. I remember we were changing in his car. He had an 89 Honda Accord EX, that this black thing with a five-speed manual transmission. And, you know, we were changing the car to go into the sales meeting, um, you know, at least look reasonably presentable. I, I learned more in a 45-minute to an hour-and-a-half sales meeting with my dad than I did sitting in classrooms for a few years, spending tens of thousands of dollars, to be honest with you, right? This is why I created the School of Entrepreneurship. This is it. It just boils down to this. And I mean, you guys can go and read that if you wanna check it out there later on, but it's all there. Um, let me get into some of the tools over here with the curriculum. Uh, stop screen. Let's see here present, share. That's it. Okay. <clears throat> I'll take some calls tonight too, by the way. I'll try to keep it on topic. Um, bum, bum, bum. Okay. So the school is open for enrollment. I do this every quarter. Um, it closes on May the 6th. So the link is in the description below and pinned in the live chat above. If you want to grab it, if you're on my email list, you'll you'll see emails all week on it with some more details and what's going on. I talk about the problem very, very clearly here. Um, a lot of people have ambitions to run the business. Like I said earlier, when I ran the survey on this page, let me see if I still have it down here. Um, survey podcast playlist community there it is there it is what is your mo main focus this year is what i ask people being more captivating losing fat gaining muscle gaining more uh, getting more women and learning what they respond to having better frame in my long-term relationship making money number one 60 percent of you responded with making more money Number two, losing fat, gaining muscle. Losing fat, gaining muscle, simple. Eat more, move. It's, it's simple. Sorry, eat better, move more. If 
fucked up uh, equation, but you know, move more, eat better. Bop, 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 right? Anyway, making more money is not as easy as it looks because the solution that I employed in my 20s was, well, I'm getting paid $1,600 a month here. They're offering me $1,800 a month at that collection agency. So let's go there. Tell my boss I'm going to leave, put in my notice. They try to keep you. They're not willing to pay anywhere close. They offer you like a fucking $20 a week raise or something like that. You go and work for the next company. It's the same thing. Same same levels of bullshit. You're only making slightly more money. That's sure. Are you making more money? Sure. Yes, you are. Tick off the box. You did it. But it's not going to change your life. It doesn't make any difference. This is why I created the course because most people, when they lean into entrepreneurship and they go and create something, they 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 find themselves in a position where they've adopted tools and ideas that are old world narratives that don't work anymore. It's like when I was a kid, it was like, oh, let's open up a dry cleaners or a, a tool and die shop. Let's go and do break jobs. Let's go and do uh, landscaping. I had lots of friends that got in the landscaping businesses, right? They went and bought a Ford Ranger pickup truck, a couple of lawnmowers, some weed whackers, hired a few other high school kids, paid them minimum wage, and they went around doing stuff like that. In the wintertime, they put a snowplow on the front of their Ford Ranger and clear driveways, right? Like these are the conventional ways of thinking which create the playing not to lose businesses, which get you under a million dollars in annual sales. You basically created a business to employ yourself and add the additional risk of legal exposure. Because as an employee, like I would rather be an employee making $150,000 a year than be a, sorry, be an employee of a large corporation. Show up, you know, my 45 minute for lunch, listen to Becky and HR bitch about her cat or something, or, you know, I'd rather do that job than have my own business. Also being an employee of that business, making $150,000 a year because you're exposed to greater risks. You have more headaches. You have problems with employees showing up. Ask anybody that is an employer. Um, I know guys that are in masonry, plumbing, electrical work. Guys, they have the hardest time getting quality employees, man. Because they're always drunk or stoned or not showing up on time or they're lazy or they're late or they break things. A buddy of mine was doing some masonry work and one of his idiot guys flipped over the freaking uh, forklift. Like you have to deal with all this bullshit while you're running the business. That's fine. The jobs need to get done. I get it. But it doesn't really solve your problem. It doesn't really create anti-fragility. It's just another J-O-B that exposes you to unnecessary risks. Because if you're the employee, you just check out and go home, fuck it. The forklift flipped over. It's not my problem. Let them deal with it, right? A statement of claim comes in and you're served at work over some issue with an attorney general, with the FDA, with the Canada Revenue Agency. It depends on you know who it might be. Uh, a competitor, somebody says that you're infringing on their rights or their marks. You have to answer that now. When you could just be an employee making the same money somewhere else, and you got to deal with that bullshit after you've bent over backwards for something that doesn't even crack a million dollars a year. And stuff. This is what I'm saying, right? Like this is how most of it generally goes for people is they lean into old world social work contracts. There's a book that, ch that, that completely changed um, a lot of my thinking called A Company of One. A few years ago, I read it. And it basically talks about how you can create a lifestyle type of business where you're not moving any physical products. You don't have a storefront to open that they can lock down in the next scamdemic. Nobody's going to tell you that you have to take this untested, un untrialed, uh, experimental jab to go to work. So you're off the hook for that. You can run the business from anywhere in the world because you're not storefront. You're not moving physical products. You're generally doing subscription revenue. You're generally doing service type of uh, businesses, or you're doing information products. You could legitimately get a sailboat, put a Starlink on it, and broadcast up to the satellites from where you are in the middle of an ocean anywhere in the world. So the notion of these types of businesses exist, but aren't adopted more mainstream. The whole premise of what I created here in the School of Entrepreneurship is to get you guys to understand the cheat codes to business. 
Because like I said, most businesses fail. They don't last. You guys can take a look at the links to all this, who I am, my background, learning events I've been to. There's a picture of me there with Kevin O'Leary. There's Cameron Harold and I, when he was coaching me about 12 years ago in my business, my staff in the business. Um, I've done everything from paid radio marketing, uh, speaking gigs. I did tours of Aston Martin, I Love Rewards, Zappos, Heck for Kids, 1-800-GOT-JUNK, G Adventures, all kinds of businesses. I would, I would go around and I would study the best. Like I said, I'm not a creator. I don't create brand new shit. All I do is I look for ideas. And a lot of this stuff you can mash up. One of the things that I've talked about before was James Altucher's notion of idea sex. You can take one thing that you like and something else you like and put it together and you can turn it into a business. Like that's essentially how I created the Entrepreneurs in Cars YouTube channel. I like hanging out with entrepreneurs and dealing with their stories. I like fast cars. Okay, how do I marry those two things up sort of thing? And it poof, turns into something else, right? It turns into something a lot bigger than what I thought it would go to, but in a slightly different direction as well. But here I am still talking to you guys today. Anyway, <clears throat> here's some more of the tools that are in the course. Um, the modules amount to, I think, eight hours, maybe nine hours now. I have another one that's scheduled for the end of May. Um with a guy that helps you set up offshore, um, essentially getting passports in other countries and paying 0% taxes, depending on what your priorities are. So that's a webinar that'll get added to this curriculum at the end of the month. This is a living, breathing thing that I keep adding to, by the way, guys. Normally I would keep jacking up the price every quarter, but I've kept it where it's at for the time being. I don't know if I'll change it for the next one, but as more material gets added to it, it becomes more valuable over time. There's also a, a private Facebook group where you can chop up ideas and network. There's monthly Zoom calls. Anyway, back to this over here. There's a whole bunch of modules. They amount to about eight to nine hours. Each module is specific to certain topics. So anyway, there's a quick introduction. I've got three mindset modules. There's taxes, legal matters, and insurance, because that's something you have to deal with when you run a business. <clears throat> ideas. Sorry, ideal businesses to run is a really important one because how you engineer the business, how you how you create it, set the groundwork, the foundation is going to determine how it's going to look for you five, 10 years down the road. Contrary to popular belief, it's very rare, even if you run a successful business, that you continue to run that very same successful business for, into perpetuity, right? Um, most entrepreneurs get bored after a while or something shifts in the landscape and they have to pivot. Any number of things can happen. And in the module where I talk about the ideal types of businesses to run, I get into the nitty gritty of like, look, if you're gonna build the foundation of something, build it with good raw material, right? Like put some good ingredients into it so that if something shifts later on down the road, you're on a solid foundation and it's, and it's easy to work with or it's easier to work with, right? I talk about how to develop a network. Every, look, Every, every guy out there that gets into a successful business is an anomaly and people challenge him and their family will say, why don't you just get a real job? This is never going to work, blah, blah, blah. The guys that play to win, they don't listen to that shit. They need a tribe, man. You know, They need a network of people that are competent enough and have the ability to support them. Uh, developing networks is extremely important in the, in the game of entrepreneurship. Uh, government regulations is something that you don't contemplate until they smack you in the face with some bullshit. So again, there's certain ways that you can engineer a business to be more easy, more lucrative, and more fun for you to run that will limit or even exclude the government from getting involved in your day-to-day -day life. You know, I've said this many times when it comes to things like relationships. Why would you want to live in such a way that invites the government to come and interfere in your fucking life? But people ignore that all the time. Oh, I'll just live with her. What can go wrong? After two years, the government looks at you and goes, you're married. That's right. And that's when shit can go downhill very, very quickly. You need to understand how the government operates, what the regulations look like, the kind of businesses that they regulate, why they regulate those kinds of businesses, the kind of regulations that you can expect on certain types of businesses. This is, again, another module that's in the course. 
I talk about why borrowing money is generally dumb. Yes, I get that some businesses need to borrow money to get off the ground, but in this in this day and age, you really don't need to. I'll be honest with you, you really don't need to. Every single business that I've started, and I've got three off the ground that exceeded more than a million dollars in annual sales. Every single business that I've started, it's been more than three, by the way, you know, that I've started, was bootstrapped. And all that means is you don't go to a bank borrowing money and you generally don't put more than a couple thousand dollars into your business bank account when you open it up. Borrowing money is generally dumb. There's certain things you're going to have to do it in. I understand. And um, sometimes you need to raise investment capital. But in this module, I talk about all the disadvantages and how you can avoid engineering a business that requires those sorts of restrictions and limitations. Human resources, well, you're going to need people, right? You need people in your business. You're going to need to hire some people. You may need contractors. There's also ways to do all of those things without people too, right? You know, you can engineer a business that is essentially a company of one. Uh, customers, building audiences and marketing. There's a long module on that, which is an important conversation because without customers, you don't have a business. If you don't have people that have an, a genuine interest in buying your offer, then you do not have a business that you can build on. Building audiences off that and the marketing strategies that are required. By the way, I've I've spent loads of money on marketing and I've also spent zero dollars on marketing for years as well. And I can tell you the zero dollar approach is way better than draining your bank account and paying huge dollars to acquire customers. You generally don't need to do it today if you do it right when you build an audience. There's another module on what not to do in business, similar to how I talk about in my book, The Unplugged Alpha, okay, there's a chapter on 20 red flags. These are the kinds of women that you do not want to invite into your life. You can, but you're inviting chaos. You're going you're gonna to complicate your life unnecessarily. It's the same thing with this module. I talk about things that you do not generally want to do when you're running a business if you want to run something that you can play to win in, something that is going to be easy to run, lucrative and fun. I've talked about um, the ELF module versus the HALF module. It's infused in a lot of the content and the stuff that I talk about. This is uh, the, the origin of this from a very smart guy named Joe Polish who, who ran, I think he still runs it, but it was a, a, a podcast called the I Love Marketing po Podcast. And there was, there was a, a strong, core, sorry, it was, it was distinguished from bad businesses um, what a good business looks like because it's easy, lucrative, and fun versus one that sucks because they're generally hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. They don't have a lot of profit margin. They're difficult to run. There's a lot of regulations. You might have to have physical storefront. You might have to move things in, in transit, you know, which creates, creates a new layer of complexity. Like when you ship a glass bottle like this, what can happen? You know, sure, it's a supplement, it's a nutraceutical. You have to have government regulations, okay? It's got to be FDA approved. The ingredients have to pass whatever. Blah, 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 blah. The glass could break in shipping. It could not get delivered. It could go on the porch and somebody steals it. Any number of things can happen. The opposite is entirely true. Like this is a course here. It's a digital product that I'm talking about. The School of Entrepreneurship it doesn't get lost in the mail. Can't get broken. I don't need any approval for the ingredients that is in it or anything like that. So like you can engineer a far better uh, business structure from the get-go if you if you take the appropriate steps right like these are tools that titans of entrepreneurs use all of these tools that i'm talking about here by the way i've been involved in entrepreneurs organization i've been to many learning events i've hired coaches i've done all of these things man like this is where this all came from this is not made up shit. this is not pie in the sky this is actual stuff that works got a module on pivoting got a module on generating business ideas because that's always a question from somebody that's like well I want to make more money. I want to write my own paycheck. I want to have freedom, but I don't know where to start. There's a module on creating ideas. Then we've got closing on participating in Zooms and the Facebook discussion. There's bonus lectures. So these are the ones that get added over time. All this stuff over here is all uh, evergreen, all this top stuff. It's all, it's all consistent. It's all going to maintain status over the next several years. But the bonus stuff is, is the stuff that I add. And I've added bonus lectures on. So I had a guest on that's published over um, a thousand books on Amazon. 
Uh, he does quite well. He's a young guy. He's under 30, lives in uh, Northern Europe, and he just published book after book after book. Like He does several books per month. He has a team. He's got an entire theme, and he talks about exactly how you know he's been doing that. There's lessons from uh, Amazon FBA and another module. It's another 41-minute uh, webinar. Um, guy ran a bunch of, bunch of different products on Amazon. He talks about why it's not. Look, I know that there's still ads out there from people that are like, oh, you can run Amazon FBA or you can do copywriting or you can do whatever. You can, but none of those things will get you over a million bucks a year in annual sales consistently, right? Uh, moving physical products is one of the most difficult things to do. I know I have some physical products. Thank God I have it structured the right way because I didn't have to pass FDA approval. It's already an FDA approved capsule. Uh, it's just white labeled with my brand on it. And that's the only difference, a high quality product. So, you know, there's there's less money in it, but it still, you know, it still allows you to offer that to your customer base without the unnecessary headaches that don't necessarily need to exist. But all those things you can get away from if you stay away from physical products, if we're being honest. I remember I had this guy in a, a call once. I've talked about this before. He had a men's jewelry line selling uh, rings, necklaces, bracelets, um, you know, trinkets and shit like that. He hated the business. It wasn't making a lot of money. It was very, very narrow margins. Anyway, 20, 30 minutes into the coaching call, I'm like, okay, well, we've identified some problems. Then I started to get into recommendations. And he stopped me like 20% of the way through on my recommendations. Like, you know, you should just buy the business off me. <laughs> like, why would I buy a business that you don't like, moving products that are that are difficult to sell, and we've already identified like a dozen of these problems, you know, with this business already. Like, I have no interest in this, none whatsoever. But people still go and create these hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating businesses just to get a business card with their name on it so they can hold it out and say, look, I'm the CEO and founder of this fucking nightmare. It's like everybody knows a guy that's got a smoking hot girlfriend or wife, but you know behind the scenes she just drives the guy absolutely crazy. And makes his life a living hell. And every year that he's with her, he's, he's knocking like a month off his life, right? At the end. So you get the point. I get into audience building on YouTube. So these two bonuses, sorry, this is a three-part bonus series on building an audience on YouTube, one and two. And then Q&A on that. Uh, there's like 90 minutes of content behind um there on everything that I've learned on building stuff on YouTube. We've got a few guys in the course right now that are building YouTube channels that are doing quite well. Um, SaaS, freelancing, Android development, crypto, blockchain, NFTs, gamings, and another one on incentives to keep employees glued to your business. Anyway, I'll pull that out. Let me grab some of these uh, super chats here. Bada boom, bada bing. I saw a few pop up here. Uh, Giuseppe question, where is the Rich Cooper video about I'm 39 year old women looking for a relationship? Thanks. Um, the clip I think is, uh, unlisted, but the original should still be in the, um, uh, podcast. I think it was two weeks ago. You, you guys can go back and find it. A lot of people were obsessed with that. I'm, I've got some ideas that I think I'm going to talk about in future on the notion of integrating um, you know, these, these, uh, questions that come up from the gals, uh, but that's not what today's show is about. So we'll reserve that for another time later. Jerry here as a lifelong entrepreneur, I wholeheartedly endorse the school of entrepreneurship. Jerry, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Uh, this course saves you significant time drawn upon riches, wealth and experience. Don't miss this opportunity. Jerry's got the course material. I, I know he got in uh, very early. So, you know, he's been in a bunch of the Zoom calls and watched um, all of the lectures. Guys, it's pinned in the top comment of the live chat. It is in the description. The school is open until Saturday. Um, if you're on my email list, you'll get emails about it. If you're following me on social media, you're going to hear about it this week because Inevitably, the same thing always happens. People go, oh, I wanted to get it, but I forgot or da, da, da. So, Look, you know, like I said earlier, when I did that um, survey and I asked people like, you know, what is it that you want? What's, what sort of content, you know, is it that you want from me? Do you want to learn about game? Do you want to learn about LTRs? Do you want to learn about being more captivating? 
You want to learn about self-care? You want to learn about making more money? 60% learn. I want to learn how to make more money. This is it. This, this is your, this is your ticket. This is it. Okay. Um, let's see what else we got here. Okay. Let's do this. I'll grab the call in link now. Uh, invite. Copy. All right. Call in and ask a Q. And I will just drop that in every few minutes because um, I got the other thing pinned to the top for this one. So the link's there if you guys want to call in and ask a question. Kind of, you know, try to keep it on topic tonight at the very least. Um, grab my little drink here. And I'll be back in a minute and a bit while we run the roll ad. This episode is brought to you by the Unplugged Alpha Supplements and Grondike Soap Company. Brothers, if you're like me and you take what you put in your body seriously, you'll want to use the Unplugged Alpha Supplements. An obsession with absorption is what sets this line apart from the others. You want to make sure that you absorb as much of the supplements as possible so you don't end up peeing out expensive urine. My supplement line is made in the United States from the highest quality domestic ingredients. And unlike cheaper supplements from China in plastic bottles, mine ship in dark glass bottles to keep your supplements fresher, longer, and won't seep endocrine disrupting plastics into your supplements. Nothing is a hard tablet. Everything is in an easily digestible, bioavailable capsule. You can filter all products by various categories, including testosterone support, estrogen metabolism, fat burning, immune health, sleep support, and performance. Visit theunpluggedalpha.com forward slash shop and use the subscribe and save option to get 10% off your supplement orders or use coupon code alpha10 for 10% off a one-time order to try it out. Then I use tactical soap and God of War beard oil every day. Tactical soap is a handmade product made in the United States from ingredients you can actually pronounce, not conventional endocrine lowering toiletry chemicals. Both the soap and the beard oils are infused with bioidentical pheromones that are designed by a clinical psychologist and pheromone expert to maximize attractiveness to the opposite sex. Go visit coopersoap.com and get 10% off your order today. Guys, check out my website at richcooper.ca for more information on booking me for coaching, my community, my courses, and a whole bunch more. You can also find all the useful links pinned below in the top YouTube comment of all my videos. Now let's get on with the show. All right, let's get on with the show. We got Brendan, who's got a question about networking. So let's take that first. Brendan. Hello, Rich. What's Thanks up, buddy? What do you got for me? I'm making a move to San Diego. Um, Can you just speak up a little bit? You're super quiet. Can you hear me better? Yeah. I'm making a move to San Diego and I plan to be going to college. One of my goals is to find better people to be around, more kindred spirits, um, and to hopefully meet people like in like the business sense and like just better quality people. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering like what are your thoughts on like how to go about, you know, getting the right five people around me um, when moving into a new city? How old are you? 24. What do you like doing for fun right now? Uh, gym surfing um seminars if they're available and music so you definitely want to get into at least two or three of those things on a social level um if you like surfing probably a cool place to meet lots of people training yeah do you fight do you do any combat sports i'm a third degree black belt in taekwondo but i actually want to learn boxing do it I did my first boxing match this weekend, man. It's fucking phenomenal. It's such an adrenaline rush. Um, I've been to two different dojos and I've never met a loser. Okay, let me reframe that. I've never met a loser that stays there long. Sometimes you get, you know, people that come in and they quit. They don't want to do the work. They don't want to take a, take, take a few punches. They don't want to sweat. But that's how you separate the, you know, the wheat from the chaff, man. I'll continue to recommend that is, you know, go and do join some sort of fighting gym and just immerse yourself into some sort of sport that you really like and then compete in it, right? Because, you know, you can't learn how to swim on dry land, right? You've got to get in and you got to indulge in it. So those are the things that I'd be doing and surrounding yourself with, uh, you know, great people and make sure you stay away from the losers. You're 
you're still a very young man, so you got lots of runway ahead of you, but just make sure you're very intentional about how you go about using that time, right? Right. And uh, that's a good point about the competitions too. Um, yeah, I'll be moving next to a boxing place, so I'll definitely do that. It's amazing, dude. You know, they're like, it seems so simple and basic, but you learn a lot of lessons getting, getting punched in the face. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. What's the uh, plan long-term once you're there? Like you're setting up a new career or is it just school or? Um, I mean, the plan long-term is to, yeah, set up a career. Um, I'm, I am learning more about business mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and just kind of seeing what's available, maybe like a startup with some people, which is why I, I want to focus on networking. Like maybe the right opportunity comes along and I got mm -hmm. the right people in my corner now that are more serious about things. Um, or, you know, diving into a company and see where that goes. Uh, that's kind of where my path is right now. All right, man. Well, let me know how you make out. Cool. Thanks, Rich. Take care. All right. Um, got Lewis, Nick. Kevin. All right. So let's, let's start chopping away at some of these. All right, Lewis, what do you got for me, buddy? Hey, Rich. Oh, I can't believe I'm on. I have uh, been listening to you for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm calling from Denmark, so it's, uh, it's pretty late at night. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. What do you got for me? Yeah. So, um, so short story, uh, I have a education fine with working, but the margins are like shit. Uh, mm -hmm. so it's a physical product and customers always like it's, it's an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. Uh, started studying, uh, engineering. Uh, but I, when I started engineering, I was already just started to listen, uh, to listen to your stuff. And so I did like a side hustle and now I quit the, the university. Uh, mm -hmm. and now I'm doing full time uh, full-time entrepreneurship. You could say it. Okay. Um, so the business that I came up with is a service where, uh, where I find the customers online or like I have an agency that finds does the social media marketing mm -hmm. and it's a sharpening service. So I'll, I, I can sharpen pretty much anything if it's hairdressing scissors or knives or, uh, gardening tools. Okay. Um, so my challenge is that I'm exchanging time for money at this point. And even if I was like, even if working like a 80 hour a week, it would still be exchanging time for money. Right. So the, the idea is to, in the long term, uh, get rid of the agency, do the marketing to sell, because right now I'm not owning my customers. They own the customers. So it's kind of like an Uber thing. How old are you? Uh, I'm 26. Have you bought my course already? Um, no, no, money is really tight. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, that, that's why I'm trying to get out of the agency. Mm. Um, cause I mean, like but, you need to re-engineer your, your perspective on how you run businesses. Cause I mean, it sounds to me like you've already, I mean, you've described two different types of businesses and they're, and they're both not serving you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a half business, both of them. Yeah, um, so but that's we're getting to to my question, not to mm -hmm. to uh, to cut you off. But uh, so the idea is to get to a point where you have a huge have a a customer base, and then start uh, getting people to do like the physical work. Then you're just like making all the bookings. Um, but and then in the long run, you get you're more building like a platform for people to, to learn the craft where it's like online courses and stuff. Mm -hmm. My question is what should my time frame be for this project? As short as possible. As short as possible. Yeah. Too many, too, too many people allow too much time between the first revenue event, the first customer, the first whatever, because it's not perfect. Mm. And the truth of the matter is it'll never be perfect. It doesn't matter. Right. Like if yeah. you have enough systems in place, then move the timeline closer. It's 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 always go as quick as you possibly can. Right, right. Yeah. Um, like I would estimate I would at least be a year from like being 
how can you say like not exchanging time for money like mm-hmm. uh, it would it would take me a while to get there okay is that like is that too slow or is it just me working i don't know man i don't slow? i don't know all the details i don't know what the strategy is i don't know what the price point is i don't know what the cost is like there's a lot of things to contemplate there man mm. right, right right but as a 26 years old like mm-hmm. spending a year i would be 27 that's not like the worst case scenario if it doesn't work out you're still younger than me when i got started you're still so younger than lots of entrepreneurs when they got started ray crock was in his 50s man there's like you got yeah, lots of runway but it's yeah. don't don't take it for granted because that's the thing a lot of people just go too slow and they're like i got lots of runway i got the i got the safe job man i got the job in my side hustle it's going to take off in three years and i got this strategy it's like will it though you know like have you tested it are people willing to give you money for what it is you know that you're offering to do is like yeah. is a problem that big enough of a problem that they're willing to solve it by paying you you know that certain price point there's a lot of things to look at man honestly like the course is 1997 it's not a lot of money compared to what you're going to pay to go to a, a school to learn basically nothing over several years it's worth its weight in gold do not discount the value of the school of entrepreneurship I've I've collected well over 20 years of information and distilled it down into lectures that amount to less than nine hours. It, it's it's the simplest, most cl- like the cleanest approach to entrepreneurship if you're serious about it. Otherwise, you're kind of like, you know, you're kind of like walking through the dark, bumping into shit and it's going to take longer and it's more costly. That's why that's why when somebody says, well, I don't know, it's just you know, I just don't have the money or it's tight. It's like, dude. People spend three thousand dollars on their next TV. They'll go and spend th- three or four grand on a fucking vacation, right? Like this is knowledge here that is good, solid information. Plus, you get access to me on on Zoom calls too, right? That that way, yeah. three months in, when you're doing something, you can hop on a call and be like, "Yo, you know, this is the update. This is what's going on. These are some of the you know roadblocks that I'm bumping into. You know, what do you think?" Sort of thing. And there's other people in the calls too that can chime in as well. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in the, in the course. Um, yeah. I was. Would you recommend buying the course and joining the ten percent? No, uh, I would. If it's if it's just business related, then I would get the course. But but for for networking and and stuff like that, uh, would you recommend it? You're you're gonna find a business network in the School of Entrepreneurship. You're gonna find less of a business network in the in the ten percent. There's a lot of great guys in there, like. Don't get me wrong, but it's just you don't have a lot of entrepreneurs in there. Yeah, I was uh, I was just curious because both uh, both groups as monthly Zoom calls is mm-hmm. that is it like two separate Zoom calls or the ten percent like... Zoom calls are not done by me. I only run the Zoom calls in the School of Entrepreneurship, the Divorce Course, and the One Percent. The ten percent group is run by uh, Bentley and uh, Jaron and Moff and a few other guys. Yeah, I know those names from yeah. watching your videos. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thank you for your time. All right, uh, I'll I'll see if I can find the money uh, okay, right man. now. It's tight, but I'll I'll probably make it happen. Okay, brother, take care. All right, see see all right. Uh, we got a few more guys here that want to hop in. Let's do Nick, George, Paul. Okay, let's do Nick here. Nick, what do you got for me, man? Hey, Mark. Um, thanks for your content. Thanks for your book, by the way um just got it in the mail about a week ago so just getting into it okay um i'm a hypnotherapist uh saw the sort of COVID happening and sort of jumped out of the electrical trade into something that i was able to work at home Mm -hmm. uh unfortunately it's not taking off as quick as i sort of wanted it to be Mm -hmm. had to go back into the workforce and i'm stuck working on the niche of my business i'm caught in i want to help too many areas but not focusing on one so your your business is hypnotherapy like what yep. what problem do you normally solve like who's your customer that's the thing i don't have a genetic generic customer i have a, an all around customer and that's right, what but I'm I mean, struggling you should, with. But I mean, you should target a customer, right? Like, if you're, like, yeah, I know a guy, for that, example, that does hypnotherapy, and his target is men only, right? Yeah, and, and he specifically deals with men that generally have issues from their childhood that he tries to yep. deprogram them on, right? Yep. So that would be that, an example of targeting a specific market. So 
Yeah. You want to get clear on who you're good at helping and then yep. target who you're good at helping. Yeah. Okay. And then so the difficulty with hypnotherapy is, is it's a time for money job, right? Like, yeah, most of these guys charge anywhere from 200 to 500, maybe $700 an hour, depending on what they're doing and, and how good they are at it. But you're still yeah. limiting yourself to, you know, a few hundred dollars an hour, right? Like there's, like there's ways that you can do it where you could probably automate a lot of it, create, you know, useful content. Mm -hmm. And follow me here. I mean, you know, you create an audience, you create useful yeah. content, maybe you automate much of the stuff that's repetitive into a course sort of thing. And then you can do mm -hmm. one on ones at a higher price point. Right. Yeah. That's going to take work, right? Like that's going to take putting out free cool. content. That's going to take explaining things. That's going to take, you know, dealing at, at, at lower rates as well, too. So it's not anything that starts with a time for money business is not the yeah. best sort of thing for that's what I was worried the about. areas that I'm talking about. But look, mm -hmm. you know, if you like hypnotherapy and, and that's your jam, then there's there's a few people I know out there that make lots of money doing it. That's that's what I was worried about. It's the time for money sort of aspect. And I was sort of trying to find a way to eliminate that time for money sort of problem. You can't. You can only you can only automate certain certain functions, right? Like there's like yeah. there's certain things like um What's that app? There's an app, uh, mine, um, I don't know, mindfulness or something. Like, are you familiar yep. with the meditation apps? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Like, yeah. Th there's a lot of guided meditation that you can do with somebody, but you can mm -hmm. automate a lot of that. And that's what those apps have done. Right. So now they just yeah. charge people a monthly subscription. You get yep. the meditations, you get access to the new meditations. It's like a Netflix thing, right? For 10 bucks a month, you get yeah. that sort of thing like that. Right. So yep. you'd have to figure out a way to sort of automate and minimize the amount of time for money gigs that you do and yep. still draw in customers with marketing and content creation. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've uh, moved to trying to move away from the one-on-ones more to the group settings, which is where it's beneficial with yep. time for money mm -hmm. because you're getting more clients at a sort of lower value, but it's still time for money. Yeah, it's it's not like doing that is never going to get you over a million dollars of sales. So one of the things that I forgot to mention earlier is like the amount of work that you're going to put into something that's going to generate two hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in sales receipts is at least the same as mm. putting work into something that can generate a million dollars a year in annual sales. It's yeah. just how you engineer the business when you're getting it off the ground. And again, yeah. that's that's a lot of the information that I put in the school of entrepreneurship is yep. it's a mindset course. It's not do a, B, C, D, and you'll get this output yep. at the end of it. It's consume the content and understand these fundamentals so that your mindset shifts from what most people do in business, which is just difficult, hard, annoying, mm -hmm. late, frustrating, and engineer something that is easier and fun and more lucrative to run because from the get-go, you've put the right ingredients into the product. Yeah. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Yeah. Well, All thanks right. for your help, Rich. All right, Nick. Where do you live, by the way? Uh, Melbourne. Melbourne, Australia. Australia. Okay. Well, yeah. Enjoy yourself, my friend. It's a bit cold now, but <laughs> winter time's come. Yeah, winter time's coming for you and summertime's coming for us. Yeah. It is Enjoy the summer. All right, brother. Take care, man. Thanks. You too. All right. Um, oh, and you mentioned you got the book too. So don't forget to leave a review on Amazon if you guys are uh, consumers of the book. Thank you so much. Um, let's see what we got here. Let's get Sean, George, Joe. Let's give uh, George a shot here. George, what's up, buddy? Hey, Rich. Can you hear me? Yeah. HVAC business owner. All right. So what do you got for me tonight? Um, I am like two years into being self-employed. Um, a couple of things that I would like your opinion on, uh, first off, uh, the first hurdle like is I'm coming up on now is like h hiring somebody as a full-time employee. I've hired subcontractors for seasonal work because my business is like very seasonally dependent summers and winters, right? And spring and fall, it's, it drops off. So it's hard to find, I I'm the only like full-time employee, um, you know, do you have suggestion on, um, obviously I need to generate more revenue, more sales. Um, 
but is it okay to keep going the route of just hiring people on a contract basis rather than the, the only reason I want to hire somebody full time is because other companies that I'm competing with, like that is how they retain employees is with benefits with, um, a company mm. truck. Um, and so that's the, really the only model that I have from my, from my perspective to go off of mm. in order to increase my income, you know, because I'm in a time, like you just discussed, I'm in a time for a dollars business. I can only charge per hour per job. And currently I do all the work. I'm young and I'm fit and I'm capable of it. Um, do you have anybody that works with you right now? Currently? No. I mean, like last week I called my buddy who doesn't have a job. I was like, Hey, can you come carry tools to and from the truck for me? Mm -hmm. Uh, And it works great, but, um, I can only pay somebody so much cash before it's not really like effective for me. Yeah. Look, man, like if, if guys like you didn't exist, if guys like my friend Jake and Sam and Kev and Paul and all these guys that, that do all this shit, whether it's HVAC, electrical, whatever, like the world would shut down, you know, for being honest. But Mm -hmm. the problem is, is that the way that that industry, the way that that work is structured is yeah, it's time for money. And a lot of the guys, end up in a situation like you where it's like, yes, I'm, I'm the HVAC business owner, but I'm also the only employee. It's yeah, hard it's for a- me to retain people. Um, I can make good money when I'm billing, you know, when I'm working, but then there's all kinds of problems that come up with that when I get employees because they don't show up or they're sick or they're lazy or what, you know, whatever it happens to be. I wish I had a better formula for you guys. And honestly, somebody out there that has cracked the code on this, has to put out some sort of content or organize some information for guys like you to get off this fucking merry-go-round of bullshit because it's the same vortex of a nightmare that i always hear and i wish i had a better answer for me for you the better answer for you from my perspective is pivot the business and go into something that's more elf but that means that you have to abandon your trade and i know that most of the guys like you they don't want to do that um so to try to like stay focused on what the issue is and what your problem is is you need good people um that's that's one of the things that i talk about in my courses look man if you don't have employees you know if you can stay away from stuff like that then it makes you grow in the business a lot easier but you need good people right like you need a guy that you can rely on say here's the address this is the job that needs to be done they show up on time they do it faster than what the you know the two-hour window you know needs to be uh You know, they drive the car so fucking efficiently, they hardly use any gas and they're always reliable doing things all the time. And guys like that are really hard to find. They're really, really hard to find, man. It's, you know, it all, it all boils down to getting really good people. So if that means you have to hire them as employees and give them benefits and do employee top ups and contribute to their retirement and all that sort of stuff and family benefits, then that's kind of a price you have to pay to get those people. Okay. Yeah, I think that's kind of the, the way to go. Um, can I ask you one more question? Yeah. Um, I started a TikTok account and just yeah. like make all these videos about my job and what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not associated with my business. I don't put like my logos on there or anything. Yeah. Um, but um, I've actually like gotten quite a bit of traction on it. Um, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I haven't generated any money from it other right. than videos, putting them on my company's Facebook page and then people call and say, I want that service. But, um, the TikTok thing like has built my confidence a lot because I'm getting like a shitload of followers and viewers and comments mm-hmm. and it makes me feel good. Um, but it doesn't actually like, doesn't make uh, any money. Yeah. Is it, is it okay to, like keep leaning into that for just like purely for flack, like more or like clout more or less like, no, it's invisible cloud. It doesn't mean shit. Like unless it, unless it makes you money, then it's just a hobby. You're just a dancing monkey. See, <laughs> The, the social media algorithms create a lot of people that that get high on those dopamine heads because it's like, oh, I got likes or I got more followers or I get more views or whatever. It's like when you step back and you look at it and it's like, you know, what's the point? You know, you should always ask yourself over and over again, like, what's the point of this? Like, why am I doing this? Right. How do I how do I turn this into money? Like, how do I monetize this? You know, is this something that I can turn into a brand is this, you know, like how do I sell something to people that are watching this? Right. Cause otherwise you're just putting out content to entertain people and you're not getting paid a dime. 
Do they do they run ads on TikTok? Could you at least monetize views? I think I could, but like I'm so small. Yeah, I'm a, such a small player, and I have. I should, like, I should have the answer to this because I have because I have a TikTok account with like a million follows, but I don't even know if it's monetizable or what it would be. Let me just check real quick for you. I've heard statistically TikTok pays the least compared to like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Yeah. Um, well, well, even with Facebook, I mean, if you want to live off the ad revenue. You need, um, geez, I mean, like you need at least five to 10 million views per month. Yeah. Um, the, the only other reason I ask about that is because in your book, you talk about influential people and women look up to that. Yeah. Well, when, when I, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a certain degree of clout that comes <clears throat> with having a social media following, but who cares if girls like it, if you're not making money? All right. Like, you know, like Jake's, Jake just dropped it in the chat there. He goes, you know, question is, how do I turn these TikToks into leads? Yeah, and there... I, I've, I've turned them into leads off through Facebook. Okay. Uh, like, what does that amount to, though, on a monthly basis? Maybe like a thousand extra dollars of revenue. Um, okay, well, it's a drop in the bucket. I mean, it's better than minus a thousand dollars. But how much time do you take creating those TikToks? Probably like 10 hours a week. So 10 hours, thousand bucks. What is that at an hourly rate? That's what I charge for like my labor service. I yeah. mean, it's a wash. So it's a wash. Yeah. So it's a wash at the end of the day. Yeah. But I mean, if you can turn more into business, you know, if you can turn more into customers, paying customers, then it would make sense to do it. I mean, if like if there's a way that you can, for example, mount your cell phone on your windshield, you might know a guy that does this on YouTube. I think his channel is called Entrepreneurs in Cars. And just sort of talk while you're going somewhere yeah. about something that's relevant that you know about, then you kind of kill two birds at one stone. You have a job to go to that's 40 minutes away. Make a make your TikTok while you're driving, just so it's not taking you away from your day to day gig. And don't just upload it to TikTok. Upload it to YouTube. Upload it to Twitter. Upload it to Facebook. Right? Like repurpose the content. Okay. Right? And then put your brand on it. You know, wear a T-shirt with your brand logo, like on your chest or something like that. Um, you know, like be that guy that's always, you know, promoting himself. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. All right, man. Take care, brother. All right. Uh, somebody dropped the super chat up here. I'm going to scroll up and get that. Giuseppe is the same guy again. Question. Why did you, why did you please unlist the video from your Richard Cooper clips? I asked because I struggled to get girls in that video. It gave me a lot of insight, knowledge on how girls think. Thanks. The, the content is still on the original podcast. I've never seen somebody spend $150 to, to, to really dive down like why. Look, if if I could tell you, I would tell you, but there's certain you know restrictions. So um, I will be talking about maybe doing things with gals like that in the insight. The problem is, is that the insight right now that's provided on YouTube kind of sucks. It's like, let's take gals, we'll put them on a table, stick microphones in their face, Ideally, find bratty, entitled ones, maybe pass out some booze to get them a little bit yee, sort of tipsy, and then let's make an example out of them for views. And I don't think that's productive for anybody. So it's clear that there's an interest in this sort of content. We'll see. I, I've got lots of projects on the go. We'll, you know, we'll cross that bridge, but I appreciate the support and the ask. I am well aware that, that uh, people want to see stuff like that. Um, got lots of emails and DMs from people that were like, Hey, introduce me to her. And it's like, dude, don't be that thirsty. Don't be that guy, please. Okay. Like you didn't even see what she looks like. All you heard was her voice. That's it. Don't be that thirsty. Okay. I always talk about simping and stop simping and <laughs> have a girl on for like a little bit. Who's got a problem and trying to help her out with it. And it's like, I'm getting DMs. Introduce me. Inter me, man. Like, here's what I look like. Send her my number. It's like, dude, dude, stop simping. Um, all right. So we got George out of the way, Brandon. Uh, I can't tell if you guys have microphones on, the ones that don't have your cameras on, because there's a line through it. Let me just check here. Uh, let's do Sean. He just turned his camera on. Let's give it to Sean. Sean, what's up, buddy? Hey, how's it going? Good. What do you got for me tonight? Um, so it's about the uh, entrepreneur course there. Okay. I'm doing uh, real estate flipping for 
the past uh, four years since like 2019. Okay. And kind of at like a pivoting point, especially with the market changing, right? But um, I had a recent opportunity to uh, look at a franchise that was in real estate property guys in Canada. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah, and um, I was just kind of curious about your opinion on franchises and whatnot because I'm still kind of on the fence with it. So franchise. So where do you live in Canada? Uh, BC, the interior. Okay. Um, I've looked at a few franchises over the years. So you're familiar with Tim Hortons, obviously the great Canadian coffee shop. I was going to buy one of their franchises and I drove, I sort of like dove into the rabbit hole of what it costs to buy a franchise. Cause there's always a lineup. There's people, they're lined up in the drive through the lineup outside. People like that shit. They drink it. It's like crack. It's like the Canadian thing. Right. So, you know, I looked into it and it's like, okay, you can buy it for this price. It throws off this amount of money, but you have to, you have to be directly involved in, in some of the day-to-day stuff. It's like, okay, now we're leaning into stuff where it's like, I'd rather just hire somebody to run it. And then there's, of course, with every franchise, you're not really an entrepreneur. Okay. You're like, what's the best analogy I can use? You're like a circus clown animal. You have a good life. You're well-fed. You've got guidelines, you know, around you, but at the end of the day, you're still kind of caged. Like you're not free. Like you, mm-hmm. all of your things come from them. And if there's a price change, you have to adopt whatever the price change is. Um, I, I personally don't like franchises. Okay. But if you want like a do A, B, C, and D, and then the formula spits out that at the end, you'll, you'll make money. You will. Um, mm. there's some franchises that make shitloads of money. Like if you, if you own a McDonald's franchise, you're a multimillionaire for sure. Right. Like there's franchises that make loads and loads of money. So, um, I would, I would look at the numbers. I would look at what the restrictions are. I would look at a lot of things and look at the fine print because there's always fine print that says, Oh, you'll have to spend a certain number of hours doing this and you can't do that. And if you do this then there's a fine for that, or there's a penalty or whatever, like there's any number of consequences, you know, depending on what it is. And for something like property, I think you said it's a property guys. Yeah. Yeah. So I knew somebody that ran actually from BC as well too. Uh, she was in the mortgage business initially and she got into uh, like a self sale packaging for real estate. I can't remember what her business was called. This is like 15 years ago when I was running my debt business, but um, it, like it didn't really, business? sorry. It was like a for sale by owner business. Yeah. Something like that. It's kind of like the property guys model, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, for $500 or something like that, you get like a package assigned, you know, the contract and all that sort of stuff. I think that's, I mean, it's cute. Like it probably works and it makes some money. I mean, it obviously did for, for her. But the thing is, is I think the blockchain is going to take care of that. I think you're going to see less real estate agents. You're going to see less lawyers. I think you're going to see a lot of legal contracts end up on the blockchain and automate a lot of the processes that lawyers and real estate agents and e- ILA and all that sort of stuff would sort of take precedent in. So to me, it's more of a dying business. Like I don't see a, a bright future in something like that mm-hmm. because blockchain technology to me seems to have a lot of the solutions to those problems that exist. And it's just the adoption rate. So will it, will it exist in five, 10 years? Probably, but I still think it's a dying business. I don't think it's going to be around long-term. Gotcha. Yeah. That's part of what I've been thinking about too, is um, like, is it going to be something that I can sell down the road once I build it? Yeah. Like you want something that's sellable. Yeah. Right. Cause I mean, like the main reason I was looking at it is Mm -hmm. because it could, uh, some of that, um, it would just get my eyes on more houses and could um, kind of my flipping business could piggy piggyback off of it. Right. So sorry, what's the main business it's in real estate. Uh, just like flipping houses, finding discounted properties, dealing with people in messed up situations. and You know what, man? You can make so much prices. more money doing that in the States. You can make way more money doing that shit in the States. I know a lot of people that make a vast fortune doing what you're doing in the States. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a buddy of mine here in um, Durham. Um, he wrote a book. And, um, you, know, we, you know, we had lunch. We had a long lunch one, one day for several hours. And he was telling me about his model. And it's like... He is, he's lucky if on the properties that he keeps, he's able to make like 
anywhere from a tenth to two tenths of a percent in rental income on the value of the property. And like the minimum rate in the States is like 1%, right? Like if they're not making 1%, they're not buying it. So all that mm -hmm. means is if the property's worth like a hundred thousand dollars, they're making a thousand dollars a month in rental draw. But that, but that same property here, that's a thousand dollars. They're making one or two tenths of a percent and draw off that property. Right. So they're making a hell of a lot more the way they've got it structured. And the market's just better down there, man. I mean, you single guy, you married or anything like that? No, no, recently single. I would, I would, I would take a look at a better market. I mean, if you got the skills to do that. And last thing mm -hmm. before you go, I was talking to some of my guys earlier about to this, about this today. Do you know what this is? No. So it's an EMF detector. Those. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Those those iPod earpod things you got in your ear. Yeah. They give off the same amount of radiation as sticking your head by the microwave oven while it's cooking something. Oh, geez. So you're frying your brain with those fucking Take things those in your ear right now. So, look, uh, like I use these, which are um, Defender Shield, so they're tubed. You'll never see me with yep. Bluetooth headphones. I'm only telling you this because I know how damaging the shit no, is. No, I did notice that. Because I have a cousin that died from cellular exposure, right? A lot of women keep their cell phones in their bras when they go to the gym, too. It's a real bad way to get breast cancer. But these, these tubes, mm -hmm. they don't have anything magnetic, nothing electrical anywhere near my head. The speakers are here, and they send sound up an air tube, right? That's what that's no, what you want to do if you got to use headphones, huh? Okay, that was a Defender Shield or something like that. De Defender Shield is a product, yeah. So, I mean, look, Appreciate some it. people say that uh, you know you get a little geeked out with stuff like that and woo woo, but I'll be honest with you, man. Human body was not meant to be around that shit. There's absolutely no question from scientists or or anybody in that field that that states that uh, Bluetooth does not give off EMF or any kind of radiation. It does. It's just the question of how much damage does it do? So what do you, if you're at the gym, then what are you doing for, for music? You connected like you can get in your pocket. Yeah. We're kind of going off on the field a little bit, but you can yeah. get these uh, bone ones, which basically go over your ears and they, and they touch your skull here and you can hear the music through your bone. You just have to make sure it's not Bluetooth and that you transfer the MP3s onto that device because it goes around the back of your head. It looks kind of stupid. A lot gotcha. of a lot of swimmers use it because they're waterproof. I just got to the point where I was like, fuck it. I'm tired of wearing head headsets. They play music through the speakers anyway. So I'm just gonna walk around with no headphones on for a change. Awesome. Anyway, different different kind of story, but um, yeah, I hope it works out for you in your real estate business. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, boss. See ya. Um, what time we got here? Nine. Oh shit. That was a good show. That went by fast. 90 minutes. Buttes. All right. Um, I'm going to do another show on this, on the entrepreneurs and cars channel, probably in a day or so on more on this. So, um, anyway, I hope you guys got some value out of this. Contemplate it deeply. If it's something that you're serious about, uh, course is open for enrollment today. It just launched. It will close on Saturday. Uh, covered it all. Just go back and look at it. The links are in the description and uh, at the top of the live chat. Hope you guys get in. I hope to see you guys on the inside on the Zoom calls. Uh, we'll be back soon next week on Monday on this channel. And I got some other content coming out on the Entrepreneurs and Cars channel very soon. So I'm going to play the podcast outro and we'll catch up with you very soon, guys. Peace out. All right, guys, if you enjoyed that podcast, make sure you visit my website at richcooper.ca to learn more about my courses, my book, The Unplugged Alpha Community, or booking me for private coaching. Also, if you are a Canadian with $15,000 or more of credit card debt and what you are doing right now isn't paying off the balances, then visit totaldebtfreedom.ca and hit get a free quote to see if you qualify to settle your credit card debt for less than you owe today over the next 48 months. Make sure you check out the top pinned comment on YouTube for all the links mentioned during the show. Peace.